So welcome everybody. I'm Jennifer Whittem. I'm the Dean of the School of Engineering. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. I also wanted to thank the Stanford Alumni Association who is co-hosting this event with the School of Engineering and the School of Humanities and Sciences. In addition to all of you here, the audience of graduate and undergraduate alumni, we're live streaming to thousands of alumni and friends all over the world. This is the fourth in our series called Intersections, and the purpose of this series is to bring together faculty from engineering and humanities or social sciences to share insights in a common, on a common theme. And tonight's theme is trust. And one interesting question is whether we will discover if we have the same definition of trustworthiness across engineering social sciences. We hope we will find that out. Um, at Stanford in general, we recognize that as we address the world's biggest challenges, they can't be addressed by scholars in isolation, but working together across disciplines, across fields. And the panelists we have today are exemplars of that philosophy. So I'm just going to briefly introduce the panelists and then turn it over to them. First, Sherrod Goyle. Sherrod is an assistant professor in the Department of Management, Science, and Engineering here in the School of Engineering. He's an expert at computational social science, which is an emerging discipline that is at the intersection, really, of computer science, statistics, and the social sciences. He founded and directs the Stanford Computational Policy Lab. They use data and computation to research hot button issues. For example, stop and frisk, racial bias, voter fraud, filter bubbles, algorithmic bias, and online privacy. Sherrod's work is relevant to a lot of other research researchers on campus, and he has courtesy appointments in the departments of computer science, sociology, and the law school. Perfect panelist today. Second perfect panelist, Jeff Hancock. Jeff is the Harry and Norman Chandler Professor of Communication. He's in the School of Humanities and Sciences, but we see him now and again around engineering. Uh, his research relies on computational linguistics and experiments to understand how the words we use can reveal psychological and social dynamics. For example, deception and trust, emotional dynamics, intimacy and relationships, and social support. Jeff founded Stanford's Social Media Lab, where researchers try to understand psychological and interpersonal processes in social media. He's also an expert on lies, so he has a TED Talk on deception that has been seen over 1.3 yeah, million times, and that is the truth. <laughs> so, second perfect panelist. And our moderator for this evening is Janine Zakaria. She is the Carlos Kelly McClatchy Visiting Lecturer in Stanford's Department of Communication. Between 2005 and 2009, she worked as the Chief Diplomatic Correspondence Correspondent for Bloomberg News, based in Washington, D.C. During that time, she traveled to more than 40 countries with then U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and other senior administration and military officials. From December 2009 through April 2011, she was the Jerusalem Bureau Chief and Middle East Correspondent for the Washington Post. She reported widely throughout the Middle East during that time, including the uprisings in Egypt and Bahrain as they began in early 2011. She appears regularly on cable news shows and radio programs. So for a journalist, at a time when a large number of Americans believe that media, media outlets are reporting fake news, this topic tonight of trust and how we establish trust must be personal and important for Janine. So please join me in welcoming Sherrod, Jeff, and Janine for what I'm sure will be an interesting panel. Thank you, Dean Whittem, and thank you to all of you for coming out this evening and to everybody who's watching us on the live stream. I think they may be carrying it on the Stanford Facebook page, so hello to everybody. Um, let me just briefly explain the format tonight. I'm going to just frame our topic uh, very briefly, lead a discussion with our two distinguished panelists, uh, and then open it up to questions. You all should have cards, I believe, uh, on your seats. So as we're talking, if you, if you don't have a card, raise your hand and maybe one of the staff can bring you one. Um, we'll start collecting them in about a half hour and we'll get to a couple people here saying they don't have any index cards. So they're coming around. Maybe some pencil 
pencils or something. Um, and we'll get to them as many as possible and we'll wrap by uh, 8.30. So we're gathered here to discuss the future of trust at a time when that question of are we living in a post-truth world seems unavoidable. Um, we're in a post-truth world with eroding trust and accountability. It can't end well. That was the headline in The Guardian last November. An Atlantic Magazine headline in January read, Trust is collapsing in America. When truth itself feels uncertain, how can a democracy be sustained? But then in August, the online courts publication came to the rescue with a headline, A Philosopher of Truth Says, We're Not Living in a Post-Truth World After All. <laughs> so, phew. Yeah. That was not you, Jeff. It was uh, Cambridge <laughs> University philosopher Simon Blackburn who wrote On Truth and who argues that the truth has always been twisted by politicians, a topic we'll get to, I'm sure, this evening. Still, uh, the current White House seems content to feed this notion that there's no ground truth. President Trump has said, quote, what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. White House advisor Kellyanne Conway famously described alternative facts. And Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, is he still the lawyer? Yes. Yes. <laughs> said, Rudy Giuliani said not too long ago, quote, ready? Truth isn't truth. <laughs> Worrisomely, as Dean Woodham pointed out, uh, a fake news system is still thriving. The real fake news. I'm not talking the fake news that the president calls fake news. Real fake news on the eve of another national election just a few days away. Along that, we have President Trump's attacks on credible fact-based news organizations that he continues to describe as fake. And we have these disturbing statistics. Three quarters of Americans say mainstream media outlets report fake news at least occasionally. 63% of registered voters believe in at least one conspiracy theory. And the Edelman Trust Barometer, which looks at trust in business, government, NGOs, and the media internationally, reported a few months back that, quote, no market saw steeper declines than the United States with a 37-point aggregate drop in trust across all these institutions. So with this as a backdrop, what I hope we could do tonight, Jeff and Sharad, is step back from those headlines and go a bit deeper in order to figure out what we can learn from social science and computer science, a perfect, a perfect pairing about what's happening to trust in all of these institutions. And I'd like it if we could leave here tonight having developed some better understanding of a few questions that I bet the audience is interested in hearing. I know that I am. First, is there more fraud or lying and lying and deception today, or does it just seem that way because of the way the internet amplifies things? Second, why is trust declining? What are the factors? And what is the digital di revolution spearheaded maybe in this room, right? I mean, right here in this part of Silicon Valley have to do with it? And third, are we actually conflating two problems? Growing distrust, distrust in institutions and growing political polarization. Um, so Jeff, let's just start with you to kick us off. You research trust and deception in your Stanford Computational Social Science Lab in our department, the Communication Department. But before we talk about the decline in trust, can you just explain the fundamentals of trust to us and how research has shown that our default is psychologically is actually to trust? Right. Yeah, well, thank you, Janine, and good to be with you, Sharon. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as Jean said, I'm a psychologist. I think a lot about uh, trust and deception. And, um, you know, a couple questions in there. First one, what is trust? Typically, most people associate it with risk. So I have to take some sort of risk in order to um, decide whether Janine will be nice to me tonight or something like that. Or I have to take some risk to decide whether that person will pay me back. And so risk is a pretty common concept. The um, German philosopher uh, Lure calls it uh, confidence in one's expectation. So what do you think is going to happen in the world and how confident are you in that? My, my take and my research group's take is it's like a promise. So if Sherrod promises to be here at this time to be on the panel with us, the, I feel confident that he's going to do that. So that's, those are some sort of core concepts of trust. How much do we believe in our expectations that other people are going to do what they say? And, and it matters a lot. So in business, for example, will, will I take that leap to trust that I can get in that Uber car with a total stranger? Will I take that leap to believe that someone will say my house and um, 
not destroy it when they rent it for, through Airbnb. So those are some main concepts for trust. In, in terms of that question about like, are we lying or trusting each other more? Uh, there's not great data in terms of, have we been asking this question of people throughout uh, decades or centuries? But there's lots of uh, evidence that this concern that we're living in a deceptive time is actually very uh, old for a human society. Pretty much every generation thinks that the current generation is more deceptive than the previous one. And I can give you some examples from yellow journalism from 100 years ago where fake news was a major concern in the US and in Canada. But we can go way back to like the Greeks, Diogenes. Anybody remember their Diogenes? Uh, any <laughs> philosophy? All right, great. What, what was he looking for? An honest man. A single honest man. And of course, he dies with a funny one. It's a very uplifting story. Um, but but the whole, that whole cohort of Greeks were worried philosophically, so really deeply, that the current generation of Greeks were too deceptive, too dishonest. And you read their writing, it, sound, it feels very much like what we're experiencing now, it's like, wow, it feels like there's too much deception and, and mistrust. So when I press you on this, because I do feel, despite what Jeff just said, that there's something distinctly different mm -hmm. about the moment we're living in, um, you tell me, Janine, you're conflating the warranted and the unwarranted worlds. Talk a little bit about that, about when you get stuff from people you know versus, depending, right. it depends, right? Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will ask me about you know, the same kind of thing about trust. And, and I think when we think about like the online world or social media or uh, online communication, whatever you want to call it, we conflate two worlds in one space. And uh, I call them the unwarranted world and the warranted. Unwarranted is all those uh, people that can now get in touch with you, can communicate with you that you've never met you never expect to meet, you have no relationship with. These are the Russians trying to contact you. That Nigerian guy with all the money, <laughs> that if you just give him a little bit, like he'll give you lots. So that's from the unwarranted world, spam. He's not real? He's not real, I'm sorry, Sean. I needed to tell you, I meant to tell you earlier. It's me. No. <laughs> So there's this world where it's advertising, it's, this is how a lot of the influence campaigns that we hear about in the news, that's how it occurs. But when Sherrod and Janine contact me, either through texting or email or Facebook or on Instagram, you name the platform, that's fine. I know these guys and, and, and I care about them. I do business with them, I collaborate with them. And I might not even have known Janine now, but I might want to know her in the future because she might be a future sales contact or somebody that will hire me. This is the unwarranted world where I don't know anybody, I don't know, and I don't even expect to know them. And here's the world of family and friends and business associates, and maybe somebody I want to date, somebody I want to have a relationship. Those two worlds kind of get conflated online. And this world, I will tell you, unwarranted, there is a massive amount of deception. We are being bombarded with uh, deception and manipulation, where companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google, the major platforms, are defending uh, against these attacks constantly. But in the warranted world, where it's sort of Sherrod and Janine and I talking to each other and communicating and deciding what we're going to talk about on this, I see a lot of honesty. I see no more deception in our studies that way. In fact, a lot of times, online communication between known people is more honest than if it's face-to-face. Uh, -face. And one of the reasons for that is recordability. We, we leave a record of everything we say, and when it's a relationship we care about, that actually changes the way we lie to one another. And maybe we can, we can come back to what that honesty or that trusting uh, does to actually perpetuating lies in a way. When your uncle who you trust forwards you something, you're going right. to trust it. It may not be true though, right? right? Shard, so a big question, and there seems to be conflicting views on this, is the role that social media and the digital revolution have played in perpetuating um, this distrust of institutions. So whether or not fundamentally the internet has led to filter bubbles or echo chambers um, that have siloed us or actually a, a wider array of opinions. And I know you, you published a paper on this back in 2016. So can you talk a little bit about what your research mm -hmm. has demonstrated on this? Yeah, so first a little bit of context. In, in 1970, how do people get the news? There were three major networks and they had a combined viewership of 80 million people. And so more or less, they were, this was uh, point counterpoint journalism and for better or for worse, people had access to roughly the same information. And I would say it's, you know, to the extent that this is objective, it's, it's more or less accurate information. Now you fast forward uh, 50 years and where are we? We're getting the news from the internet. And when we did our study, we tracked the browsing behavior of a sample of Americans and 
it's not particularly surprising, but there are differences in how Republicans and Democrats get their news. Mm -hmm. So the, what's the number one news site for Republicans? Any guesses? Fox. That's an easy one. What's the number one uh, news site for Democrats? <laughs> no. New York Times. <laughs> no. You know, you, you would want that to be. It's, it's Huffington Post. Oh. Right? <laughs> and so it's like, sorry, we're not. Uh, so what is, uh, what is the uh, punchline here? Both Democrats and Republicans are getting their information from these sites that have you know, advertise themselves and cater to these audiences that are looking for partisan information. Neither Fox News nor the Huffington Post are really going out there and saying this is the truth. I mean, maybe there's you know some kind of version of this out there, but really there's a lot of partisan commentary on these sites. And this is the number one site for both Democrats and for Republicans. And this is growing over time. When we look back, you know, five even ten years, we do see this uh, this rift expanding over time. Uh, now, the flip side is, and, and this is why this is a complicated story, is that a lot of times online, people are getting their information from the other side as well. So if you go on to Facebook, again, for better or for worse, you often see those views that you wouldn't see in your everyday life. You know, if I'm sitting here, you know, really, what is Stanford? Stanford's a bubble inside of a bubble inside of a bubble. It's the ultimate filter bubble. I mean, how much do I interact with people who really fundamentally disagree with what I'm saying? Almost never. At least online, you can get that type of experience. And so this is this, this funny um, fact, and they're both, you know, we, we think both of these facts are actually accurate, that, you're, that the internet is, is polarizing people in the sense of where they're actually getting most of their information, but at the same time, it's giving people opportunities to get outside of their geographic, socioeconomic bubbles. Mm -hmm. But so is the fine, so there's conflicting findings? In terms of what the, I mean, and does, do any of them relate to this rapid decline in people's trust for the media broadly, the fact that they're only reading certain things? So, so we don't, so this is a really great question and we don't know the answer to it. It's like, it's very hard to say what is the effect of these things. So one, a couple data points here. So one is that we looked at this during the election and we looked at it the first uh, couple months before the election and we tried to determine are people who are going to these sites, are they becoming more polarized? And we actually don't see any evidence of that. That's what we were expecting. That we were saying that, oh, all you're getting all this exposure to Fox News, you're getting all this exposure to Huffington Post. We were expecting that people would spread out. In fact, we don't see evidence of that. Now, there are a couple theories. You know, one is that this was such a polarizing election that everyone had already selected into whatever news media source they were going to go to. That if you're watching Fox News, then that's it. You've already made up your mind. If you're going to Huffington Post, you've already made up your mind. It's not going to have any more of an effect. Another is that this isn't really fundamentally what's causing the polarization in the first place. Now, we don't know what's going on. And if you unravel this, at some point it breaks out, it breaks down that it does feel like the media is giving us these, this perspective on the world, and so at some point it does feel like it has to be the media. At the same time, we're already in this equilibrium maybe where the media can't actually push us. How many people do you say, oh, if only they had read this New York Times article, they would change their view on Trump? I mean, that seems farcical at this point. That's not actually going to happen. And so what is the role of the media? It's, it's unclear. So I have a lot to say on the role of the media, but I'm going to hold off because the, the, the trust question goes beyond the media. And so we can circle back to that, I think, in the Q&A. And so, Shard, I can't open up the New York Times on a Sunday without seeing like 18 articles on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And you teach a class called Law, Order, and Algorithms. And I know that your research has shown that algorithms can actually, for example, help eliminate bias in things like sentencing decisions and things if it's used properly. But there still seems to be a lot of concern about how bias is being built into algorithms that are becoming an increasingly prevalent part of our lives. How do you see this whole question? Yeah, so I think this again is one of these complicated issues. There's no clear answer, but let me give you um, one story. So one recent uh, incident, probably many of you have seen this, Amazon was in the news recently because of this hiring algorithm that it was using to vet applicants. And what was it doing? Well, we don't know exactly the details, but roughly it was training this algorithm to understand if, if applicants were similar to their current applicants, uh, their, their current hires. And one thing that came out is that this algorithm was downweighting the word uh, women's in its CVs. And so women's chess team, women's college, things like that, they would down with this. So this, I think many people would interpret as bias. And I think that's probably right. We don't know exactly the details, but that seems like it's one of these, one of these high impact algorithms that's actually having direct impact on people's lives and probably recreating this type of bias. Now the headline on that story was the algorithm is biased 
you know, and the algorithms are going to kill us. Now, what is the backstory? Well, where are these algorithms coming from? They're trained to human decisions. And so it's not we have this choice between these imperfect, biased, terrible algorithms and this great humans. It's like that's not the choice. And so it's like the algorithms don't have intent. You know, they're not, we, we shouldn't anthropomorphize them. They're basically just reflections of us. And in this circumstance, again, this got a little bit buried in the story. Probably Amazon was doing something funny. Mm. You know, maybe implicitly, I and mean, it's it's an unclear what's going on, but probably that's what was driving these types of algorithmic effects. So I think it's very important to understand that yes, algorithms can recreate bias, they can exacerbate bias, they can do all sorts of these types of things. Now the flip side is, in many cases, we can actually get around human bias. And so in, in one of the examples that I study in my work is in uh, judicial decisions. And so here, again, this is, it sounds a little bit scary, but algorithms are being used to guide judicial decisions all across the country. This is happening. It's not fictional. It's happening right now. And honestly, I would personally rather be evaluated by an algorithm than a human judge. Uh, and so this is the trade-off that we, that we need to understand is what is the, what is the counterfactual? What is it that we're, that we're trying to decide between? And in many cases, if we design these algorithms well, then we can get we can get around some of these human biases that are creeping into these decisions and which will always be there. Jeff, do you want to weigh in on that? Do you agree with Shara? Y you know, I do. I, I, I mean, we Why see... do you sound so surprised? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> normally I don't with Shara. No, yeah, uh, yeah I, I mean, we have been looking a lot. So Stanford is getting uh, really big, obviously, into uh, AI and um, in particular the human-centered aspects of AI. Can we create AI that are, are going to help humanity, that are going to make uh, things better rather than just uh, optimizing for whatever outcome? And I think what Sherrod was saying is that they're often a reflection of us. And many times with uh, biases for humans, it's really hard to overcome. So, you know, in hiring decisions, women will often be just as biased against other women as men, right? So there's lots of evidence of that. But when it comes to algorithms, we can, uh, you know, sort of look at them. And it's not us, it's a mirror of us, but we can look at that mirror and make some decisions. So uh, I'm actually pretty optimistic around that kind of um, thinking. So, Shard, another uh, example of intersections between communication department and, and computer science was your work with my with our colleague Cheryl Phillips on what's called the Stanford Open Policing Project, where you all gathered traffic stop data from across the country. Um, talk about what you found from that research in the disparities and how the criminal justice system impacts different people from different races and how it ties to declining trust in another institution, namely the police. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we looked at traffic stops all across the country. We collected data over several years of over, I think we're at 250 million traffic stop records that we've now collected. Um, and we analyzed these for evidence of racial bias. And again, unsurprisingly to many, I suspect, we found evidence of racial bias. And so this, I think one interesting thing about this line of work and how it relates to trust is that there's this kind of reflexive adage that transparency builds trust. And in the short term, I don't think that's right. I think in the short term, it's like, yes, we're being transparent. We're, we're showing that this is actually out there. We really do believe, and we have strong statistical evidence to suggest that there is bias in police decision making. We also see these, uh, these videos that have changed the way that we perceive the police. And again, this is a form of transparency. We're getting to see what's going on. But if what's actually going on is not particularly fair, is not particularly what we want to see, that degrades trust. And again, at least anecdotally, I think that is contributing to our current perception of policing and our lack of trust, or many people's lack of trust in policing, is that we actually get to see what's going on. And so there's this tension that in the long run, you know, I, I kind of have to believe that transparency is good, um, but you know, sunlight is the ultimate disinfectant. I think in the long run that is true, but in the short run, there's this uncomfortable place where you're seeing how it's made, you're seeing how actions are being taken and that is I, I think that can erode trust at least in the short term. So Jeff I know you've talked you and I've talked about this that you think yeah. the decline in trust in institutions has to do with seeing how the sausage is made. That's right yeah and, and I've never talked to Shroud about this so I'm, uh, we're, you know you can trust us this is two independent opinions. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think a lot of the if you think back to most of the political and corporate scandals over the last five ten years a lot of times is because something digital allowed us to see the sausage being made in an institution from the Catholic Church to the Volkswagen uh, Dieselgate scandal to the Panama Papers. 
The fact that we're digitizing things, which means that we can apply uh, big data techniques, including machine learning and AI, we can share results with colleagues instantaneously. I think these are the some of the things that in the short term, as I like the way you put it, in the short term, it's undermining our trust because it's like, wait a minute, all these institutions that I've trusted for so long, government, media, uh, not-for-profits, they're, they're not as trustworthy as I thought. We're seeing that in part because of this digital transformation. I think in the long term that this is good. This is going to make those uh, organizations, institutions realize that they can't be hiding some of the, the sausage making that they've done in the past. But there is a short term price to pay for that. And that's these scandals. And, and hopefully it changes the incentives too. Right. So exactly. it's like when we're transparent, when you know you're going to be audited, you know, it's uncomfortable at first, but hopefully that makes it so that you're actually doing the right thing at the end. All right. So um, I'm going to ask a Trump question. Um, so there's a Canadian reporter named Daniel Dale who live tweets a lot of President Trump's rallies. And he's been covering him quite consistently every day. And so he, he tweeted on... Uh, I'm guessing I'm directing this at you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, on October 22nd, after a certain day in the news, um, this is, I fact, quote, I fact-checked every word Trump has uttered for two full years. This is one of his most dishonest weeks in political life. He's lying about so many different things at once, and in big ways, not exaggerating or stretching, completely making stuff up. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, Harbor Hound, whoever that is, tweeted this question. How did we get to this point where a self-promoting con man is able to impose his own reality on the entire nation? So whether or not uh, you're a, a Trump supporter or not, there's this perception and there's this, I mean, we know from Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post that he's lied 5,000 times or whatever the number's up to taking, since taking office. How did we get to this point, you think? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, for somebody that studies deception, Trump has been really amazing. And, um, <laughs> and, and so I, I, I should also, I, I like the way Janine said it, is like, so this is about thinking about deception, not uh, uh, left or right or Democrat, Republican. So I'm actually a Canadian, so uh, I have some, uh, well, I'd you know, the Canadian so, journalist, too. Yeah, and a Canadian journalist, exactly. So, um, uh, one concern that a lot of my Republican colleagues that I, I meet, say, in the, in the hockey uh, locker room, I play hockey, and so it's a great place to meet people, because here on campus we don't, we don't see a lot of Republicans, actually. <laughs> and uh, I think I spotted one the other day. Yeah, 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 over yeah, the Hoover yeah, Tower. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so when I talk to my Republican friends, um, you know, and, 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 we, and we sort of talk about um, why, why they support uh, Trump, um, it's, it's actually uh, not unreasonable. So. One of their concerns is, well, what about these fact-checking sites? Like, they're all from these liberal uh, organizations. And so uh, I took that to heart. And what we started to do is look at um, how fact-checkers have compared Trump to other Republicans. And so you can go back to McCain, when, which is one of the first times when fact-checking really is done at, at scale. They looked at almost every one of his statements on the campaign. And you look at uh, Romney, okay? So you also see him, and it's been carefully uh, documented for all of his deceptions. And most politicians, those two included, are in the 20 to 30% range. So usually in a relatively stringent uh, definition of what is deceptive, so that means there's some deception in this claim, most Republican politicians are in the 20 to 30% of all claims they make on the trail. Or have some deception. It turns out Democratic uh, candidates are in the same range. We can look at uh, Rubio and Cruz, who make it pretty far in the Republican primary against Trump, so we're kind of controlling for time. They're also in this sort of 20 to 30 range. Trump at that time was in the 55 to 60 percent range, which uh, it's actually hard to lie that often. We, we've looked at lots of uh, <laughs> students and we get them to tr we track their lies in text messaging, and very rarely, even with our most prolific liars, do they get up above 30 percent. It's actually hard. <laughs> so we're comparing Trump against other Republicans, and we can compa compare him against uh, contemporary Republicans. And then you can also look at people that have worked with Trump. You can also look at Trump's own words, he doesn't deny that he's into hyperbole and, 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 and saying things that aren't necessarily true. He, he doesn't deny it. People that work with him also recognize this. And a lot of his supporters are also fine with it. So we thought initially this was a real puzzle. Why is it that he can lie all this time and, and be sort of like admitted about it? Why do his followers are like, yeah, he does, he lies. And still his trust level never declines with his base. It's, it remains around 37% trust level in the US. 
which is around the same as Clinton, for example. And so, you know, Jeanine and I have been talking about this a lot. And it, I think in, in, rather than being a crisis of trust in somebody like Trump, it's a polarization issue. And I, you know, we have a colleague in communication that studies uh, politics and polarization. His, his argument is like, Jeff, this is no puzzle. Like, if you're a Republican these days, and that's your guy, you will vote for him and you will trust him. And if you're a Democrat, and she's your person, then you're gonna vote and trust them. And it's as simple as that. And he has this great and horrifying story where he's like, in the 70s, if we asked people, how would you be if your son or daughter married somebody of the different race? And Americans at the time were like, I'm not so comfortable with that. About 80% would say I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, now, if you were to ask that question, uh, good news is most Americans are totally fine with that. Over 80% are like, yeah, no, that's totally fine. Bad news is if you ask, what about if you marry uh, somebody of the political uh, ideology that's the opposite of yours? 80% say I'm not okay with that, <laughs> right? To the point of like, I might not talk to him, my daughter or son. So this polarization is like as bad as racism was in the 60s and 70s. Let me just try and push back for a second here because yeah. I do think there's something unique about the frequency and the spread, the way these things spread, the way the media covers it and all these things and, peop and the lack of uh, accountability. Or, I mean, I think there is accountability journalism being done about this, but uh, I guess the lack of the impact. Right. And so um, is it something that, some, you know, someone who's not like I am who follows the news every second says, it's the president. Right. Or is it that they just don't care? He doesn't mean it. There's become this complacency. He doesn't mean it. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, initially when we were looking at Trump, um, and this is before he was elected, we were relying on this guy Harry Frankfurt's philosophical definition of uh, bullshit. I'll say BS. Okay. <laughs> and uh, BS is when somebody says something that isn't necessarily deception. The person doesn't even know what the truth is. They're just unconcerned with the facts. And I did some work initially on this and uh, thought that it was an, an interesting framework because uh, a lot of times Trump will just say things and it, it's not clear whether, the, whether he knows what the truth is. He just doesn't care. And over the last two years, it's become clear that I think that was a mistake because BS um, trivializes uh, what happens when someone occupying the presidential office, any office of power, okay? So it can be uh, any place, not just the US. Um, the appropriate, the rational thing if you're a citizen, okay, is, and you're, you're, you're living your life, uh, you're working, uh, you check in on the news every once in a while, but the rational thing is to believe your leadership. That person has been voted by you and your, the majority in your country, roughly, that um, you should believe what your leader has to say. And this is something that I should uh, clarify. The, there's only one effect in all deception detection research over 60 years, hundreds of studies. There's only one thing that ever replicates every single time. And that's the truth bias. That is, we, we by default believe other people. It's what language is built on, it's what society is built on. So the, the natural thing, the rational thing is to believe what your uh, leader, your politician, your, your political leadership thinks, says. And so the danger here, and I don't know if we have the Hannah Arendt quote, but the danger is that uh, when a president, somebody occupying that position lies, he, he or she is actually changing reality for a lot of people, at least in the short term. Because those people are rationally trusting what he or she is saying. And that's the danger, is when somebody that's unconcerned with the truth is put into a position where they can then create that reality. Right, so if we the Hannah Arendt quote. quote from the origins of totalitarianism, I'll just read a portion of it. Quote, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. Mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd, and did not particularly object to being deceived because it held every statement to be a lie anyhow. Right. And it goes on and on. But right. And so, so. because this is, we're so polarized, I think what happens then is that, okay, so... Uh, my leadership said something that, that has been shown to me to be false. And we'd normally think that would be a violation of trust, but in Hannah Arendt's analysis, she says at this point when there's two parties that, that really hate each other, they're at war, when a political leader does that, they say, well, I knew that he was lying. It's a weapon, it's a tactic 
It's clever. He's trying to beat that other side. And so when Trump's followers are uh, say, yeah, of course he was lying. He has to do that in order to beat the liberals. Right? He has to do that. It's a tactical uh, thing. And so it's not irrational. I, that's, I think that's really important. Um, it's upsetting and, and it's uh, really difficult to deal with, but it's not necessarily irrational. So, Shard, it's not only that people, when they go online, are confronted with uh, uh, just an impossibly hard platform of, to navigate of real news, r fake news from the Russians, uh, you know, all these different kinds of things, lies from the president sometimes, you know, all these things hitting them at once, conspiracy theories. They're soon going to be facing deep fakes. And so, and I know I said we go behind, beyond the headlines, but just the other day in the New York Times, will deep fake technology destroy democracy? Namely, the idea that you could take a, this audience will know. But for those who don't, take a video of President Obama and make it look like he's saying something else. Do I have to worry about that too? Yes. <laughs> Be very mm -hmm. scared. Mm -hmm. Be very scared. Yes. Um, have, have people seen these deep fake videos? How many people have seen them? About half, or a little okay. more than half, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you won't sleep <laughs> after you watch one, it's extremely disturbing. Um, the only comfort I take is that people already don't care too much about the truth. So That's maybe, your it's, it's okay. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we've already uh, bottomed out. I mean, if we have like half of Republicans still think Obama was born in Kenya, that wasn't a deep fake. That was like a pretty shallow fake. And so it's, you know, like Jeff was saying, that there's this partisanship here that goes well beyond the facts. And I do think that one of the big problems with this technology is it raises the cost of identifying the truth. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make it astronomical. And so I do think that the mainstream media will be able to discover what is true and what is not. Um, maybe it'll take them 12 hours now. But the problem is, in those 12 hours, lots of people will already have formed an opinion. And it's very hard, once they form that opinion, to switch it. And so I do think that there's a real cost here, not for, not for people who genuinely want to understand what's going on, but by adding noise, by making it just much, much harder to, for the regular average person to figure out what's true and what's not. So in this climate where everybody's become a publisher of anything they want, uh, a news story, a fake news story, a fake video manipulating President Obama, whose responsibility is it ultimately then to police this to make sure that we actually can still have our democracy because you're telling you're, you're what you're saying is that well people are going to they're going to they're going to buy it. I mean, we've had this discussion a lot is it the platforms, is it the government, is it the news organizations uh, who's got who has to take the lead here for either of you? Go ahead, Sean. Mm. Um, is it I, us? I, I, the, I, I trust Jeff. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> You know, in some ways, I don't know if this is the right question, that we can't just decide who's going to police it and then we're done. It's not clear this can be policed. Like, this is just happening, and sites have already banned this type of content when they can identify it, which is, you know, not always the case. And so it's not clear to me that you can just say, okay, we're just going to ban it, and now we're good. Um, you know, the media, I mean, what, I mean, what exactly are any of these actors actually going to do concretely? Um, and I'm not sure that what we actually can do, except for keep on doing what we are, and just saying this is true and this is not, and hope that at the end of the day, people will actually trust these sources that have a reputation for telling us the truth. But can we actually curb this technology? I'm not sure. Right. Uh, well, that's a solution. I mean, Manish is work, your colleague Manish is working on this, right? I mean, whether we can... Problem is, every every video has been manipulated, even like a professional video in some way, mm -hmm. right, Jeff? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have a similar take as Shra, but I, I think you know, there's two reasons that I remain an optimist uh, above and beyond the fact that I'm Canadian. Um, <laughs> the first is uh, it's often like an arms race. You know, when 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 spam um, took over our inboxes in the '90s, it felt like email is dead, right? It's it's a it's a dead technology because uh, it's been overwhelmed by uh, spam. And you know, email's thriving. It's still used uh, as much as any, any other uh, application. And there, there were solutions to it. It wasn't just technological, it was also financial. It had to remove the incentives that uh, spammers had. But there's still billions and billions of pieces of spam every day. We just never have to see them anymore. So it's a, I think there's always like this arms race component. And our, our other colleagues here at Stanford will be fighting back against deep fakes. Uh, 
Sherrod's totally right. It won't always be perfect, and there will be some that get through and some that don't. But I just, I never feel like there's a technology that will just wipe us out. I just don't buy technological determinism. That brings me back to my second one, which is us. You know, we, I think, will adjust to our new media ecology. It's going to take a little while. I mean, if we think about it, uh, World War II is when more people on Earth were literate than were not. That was the tipping point for literacy. And since that time, the amount of changes in our, in our world has been radical. How many people today have written something? <laughs> Everybody. Everybody's written something today. So in 1940, only half of the world could even imagine writing something in the day. So we're undergoing massive uh, change in our, in our information environment. And it will take time to adjust. It will be painful. There will be mistakes made. There will be casualties. But I, I just fundamentally believe that we as humans will adjust to the technologies that we've mm -hmm. created. As the uh, American, I'll take the more pessimistic view on this. Let's do it. <laughs> and, uh, I think the fundamental difference between spam and deep fakes is people want deep fakes. Mm. You know, they, you know, no one actually wants, you know, maybe some people want that Nigerian right. you know, letter. Right. But for the most part, I think we don't actually want it. With deep fakes, fakes people really want to see it. They might even intellectually know maybe it's not quite true, but they like seeing it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a real problem. Yeah. And so whenever people want it, I think the market is going to provide some avenue for getting this type of information. Yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe these main streets, like maybe Facebook will ban it, maybe Twitter will ban it, but there are always going to be these fringes. And this is both the benefit and the, the fear of the internet mm -hmm. is that people can do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be these sites that, that cater to this audience. And, and this is a way of, of polarizing attitudes. You know, as depressing as that is, I like that framing because it actually, it brings us back to us, right? It's, it's not like the technology is causing us to uh, want to see fake, uh, deep fakes that are like uh, revenge porn, you know, really horrible, horrific effects on people. It's, it's, it's human motivations in a way, right? Like, I think that point is a good one, which is I want to see, I want to see Obama say something really stupid, right? And, or I want to see Trump say really something, something stupid. So to me then, it's, 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 it's us in a way. And, 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 and then it gets back to uh, education, uh, values, norms, all of these issues that we've, you know, spent uh, millennia working on and what do we as humans think are important and valuable and what is wrong but it doesn't it doesn't hand off everything over to technology and say well because it's here because it can do this or can do that we're doomed uh, I, I as pessimistic as it is I, I, I actually like that approach it puts it back uh, on us we don't have the tools Jeff mm. How are we going to do that? People, keep, people don't even know what they're reading, what they're looking at. They don't even believe. They think that, you know, I was at an event and a, a guy was trying to convince me that the New York Times had made up the open, opening anecdotal lead. I mean, mm -hmm. it whole, this whole, the whole notion that people are going to be able to figure this out on their own, mm -hmm. I, it's too much of a burden. But, yeah. I, but I recognize the problems. I mean, the research shows if you label things as fake, then they'll believe everything else that's not labeled. So you have to label an infinite, <laughs> an infinite amount of material, right? Yeah. And so I think re how we restore respect for institutions, right. like government agency data, yeah. which our own president has doubted, mm -hmm. not only the media, the media, the, uh, I mean, uh, there's got to be some shift, right? I mean, something's got to happen to restore that faith. Mm -hmm. no? Well, okay, so one thing that's concrete, uh, in that Edelman Trust Report, so this is the Edelman Trust Barometer, it's been going on for about 25 years, asked people how much they trust different things, uh, you know, lots of countries, over 50 countries. And uh, one thing, I don't know if we've talked about, mm -hmm. Jeanine, but there's one big uh, plus, so one group of individuals uh, gets a 12% boost from this year over last year, and that's journalists. So even Not though there's, a, yes, yes, even though there's a decline in media, Mm. You don't There's, trust Jeff? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I, I know this one very well. Uh, academic yeah, experts were up right. plus one. So, um, but no, so I think that people are starting to recognize that journalists play a valuable role as, as a gatekeeper. I, I do believe there's a turn. So that's one concrete piece. Here's something more speculative. You, Janine, you might be right that like we, all of us in this room, are maybe somewhat unequipped to deal with the world that we've created. But I do believe 
that our children, younger people, who are much maligned these days, wrongly I believe, I think that they're developing the skills to be able to determine uh, what is uh, you know, something that's genuine versus something that's authentic. I don't have a lot of hard evidence about this, but we're working with a really great not-for-profit that works in the Bay Area, all kinds of kids, very diverse, all kinds of socioeconomic statuses. They're going in and, and, and uh, meeting with these kids and doing some interventions and learning about it. And these, to them, these are, these are adult problems. Problems. They're like, no, I would just check on this. I would never believe one video. And it's like, you adults do that? You guys believe one? Like, yeah. they, they, you know. And so I kind of think that they're developing because they're children. They're developing a, a way of understanding the world that we simply can't. So, for example, my favorite mode of communication is email. And I think it's kind of like, um, you know, your favorite music is the music that you heard when you were in your teens, early 20s, right? And you still, even though we're old, we still like that. It's like technology. I like email because that's what I kind of like grew up with, right? And none of my students use email except <laughs> to communicate with old people like me and Sherrod and Not Jane. me. Not, yeah. me. Not even I don't, you. I don't you, use email. You doesn't use email. <laughs> See, he's even moved on. So, so I think like there's a certain... Um, I, I have a, a deep sort of like confidence in younger people that will kind of come in and, and the problems that we're like, these are unfathomable, to them will be like, we've been dealing with this ever since we were five. You really are an optimist. I know. Right? Right. It's true. It's true. The young yeah. people will save us. <laughs> yeah, the young people will it save us. It does help uh, having an office next to Jeff when you're worried about these issues. Um, we can start taking, if anybody wants to bring me the questions from the audience, I can start integrating them. But while they're being brought to me, what about your own trust for the two of you? I mean, mm. in what you read, say, in the press or in academic articles, uh, Shara, I think you told me that you're always skeptical of reading any scientific study on discrim discrimination because it's often tinged with part. I mean, do each of you look at academic art, peer-reviewed academic articles differently? I do. I, I feel like we're now falling into the optimist pessimist <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. mode here. But yeah, I am pretty skeptical, and yeah. I I do think that partisanship has, uh, you know, to me, very surprisingly entered into the academic sphere. And again, this is me being naive, but five years ago, I would have thought that computer science statistics, we sit above uh, this sort of, you know, this sort of debate that's happening in the social sciences. It's like, no, we, this is part of, this is affecting our work. We think of this as very mathematical. We think of this as objective. In fact, there's all sorts of attitudes through which uh, the results that we report are filtered. And I see that a lot, and I find that highly disturbing. And like you were saying, that this, this means that I am particularly skeptical when I read papers about these polarizing issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So, uh, Shrad's right that, like, in the social sciences, uh, there's been concerns about, you know, partisanship influencing. Um, Academics and social science. Uh, my colleague, who's here, Jeremy Bellinson, was ha having a, a, a congressperson visit, and he was showing him some climate change stuff. And afterwards, you know, I think Jeremy said, "You know, how, what do you what did you think of this climate change stuff?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, it's good. It's it's liberal science, but you know, it's pretty good." And to me, it was just like, "Whoa, wait a minute. We're like dividing science now by like what your political party is, and that just feels really wrong." And 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 that is uh, upsetting for me. Uh, you know, I just finished this giant meta-analysis, 256 studies of how, how social media affects your psychological well-being. And boy, reading some of them, you just see in it, people came to their research with an idea. I think you know, Facebook's bad, or I think Facebook's good. And you just see it in the, in the paper. And, and that's been a bit depressing, I have to admit. Okay. okay finally, I got yeah, you finally, there's. I'll try and find I broke you down. <laughs> you broke me. <laughs> so, uh, a couple questions uh, on blockchain here, and someone working in the blockchain space, and the idea to be able to do trustless transactions. How will this affect um, personal transactions? Will it affect social trust? Blockchain? Do you, where are you guys on blockchain? Bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or do you want to, we not have any no. deep thoughts on this? Some, some thought. I mean, so blockchain is this idea that I don't need to trust an institution anymore. I can trust um, a, a, a sort of uh, networked, defined uh, set of trust. And I think the same, it, it'll, it'll be an adaptation into this sort of space. For me, one thing that's exciting there is we think about something called folk theory, which is sort of how we think about complex systems. And so blockchain is a complex system. Many, most people won't know any including me, the specific mathematics of it. Um, and so whatever folk theory they bring to it is going to play a big role in whether they trust it or not. So the actual nature of the blockchain is one thing. People's psychological understanding and perceptions of it will be a whole other thing. Okay. 
People are concerned. I guess we're striking the wrong, the worry tone here. What can, Sherrod, oh, it's probably me. Okay, what, what, what can we do here? If someone believes a lie, maybe Jeff, if someone believes a lie, what can anyone or any institution do to change that person's mind? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'll take two approaches. Anybody remember Columbo? Sort of like the Columbo mm. thing? Yeah, okay. So Columbo, uh, he didn't go about uh, trying to learn things by looking like I'm not going to look in Sherrod's or Janine's eyes to try and see whether they're telling the truth because there is no Pinocchio's nose. There is no reliable cue that tells you somebody's lying all the time. What Columbo did was ask questions. He formed relationships with everybody. I could say, Sherrod, where were you last night? And he would tell me, and then I'd ask Janine, I'd ask Brian, people that know him. And, and by asking questions, I learned you know, ultimately as good of the truth as, as, as I might want. And so that's the Columbia approach. We live this in an amazing area where we have massive tools for asking questions of giant amounts of information. So to me, uh, I think that's one, is, is there's ways of asking questions that, that we are just now taking advantage of. In terms of changing somebody's mind, uh, it depends. If, if you're in their tribe, if I'm a Democrat and I'm trying to convince a Democrat about something that they've been misled on, I'm going to do really well. If I'm uh, doing that across tribes right now in the US, again, because I think polarization is maybe one of the top problems in this space, uh, good luck. It's going to be really difficult. And so I think that the tribal aspect is going to be really important to that. Charlie, you want to Yeah, I mean, I think this is all predicated on the assumption that people want to know the truth. And it's not at all clear to me that that's the case. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's, you know, the, the question that, but how do you persuade someone? Well, presupposes that they actually want to know what's going on. And this tribalism is, it makes it very unclear that, that this is fundamentally what's at play, that people maybe just want to be comfortable. And that can, doesn't necessarily have to play out by understanding what's really going on in the world. And that's, to me, one of the most disturbing aspects of this, and also this normalization of, of, uh, of this uh, telling lies in, in this political climate, right. is that it's bringing to the surface this idea that you know, it's not necessarily about the truth. It's about how people decide to view reality. Right, and, and I'll just follow up on that because I think that's very true. And then when you get outside the political space, if you talk to corporate leaders, you talk to people in the military, they have none of this, right? They're like, no, I need to know what the facts are because I've got people out there that will die if not. I've got, uh, I've got a thousand people that I'm uh, in charge of and if I'm basing off, you know, I'm running this corporation based on some facts that aren't really real, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt a lot of people. So I think the political space, you're mm -hmm. exactly right. I think in a lot of other parts of yeah. human life, facts really do matter and people really care and they do want to know the truth. Medicine. Yeah. What's that? Medicine. Medicine, yes, exactly. My dad, uh, he and I disagree a lot about climate change, um, but when it comes to you know medical issues, he doesn't want to like hear what some crank that has no uh, background in uh, science has to say. But when it comes to climate change, he's very interested in the crank with no uh, background <laughs> in science. But I think that's right. Like, so yeah. there's there's domains yeah. of our life where facts and truth yeah. are super important, and there's other ones where yeah. I don't want to know the truth. I want to feel good. I think, I think that's exactly right. And again, one example from 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 my own work is looking at this police discrimination. So this is a highly polarizing topic. When I talk to general audiences about this work, it's clear that this is dividing people along partisan lines. Mm. The first time I went to talk to a police department, I was terrified that this was not going to be well received. And in fact, much to my surprise, they were extremely receptive because they want to know. You know, they fundamentally need to know how their organization is operating and how to make it better. You know, lives are at stake. The community really will react to their policies. And when you have something there on the other side, when you actually have some skin in the game, then I think that changes the balance. And this is actually something that we're currently doing is we're trying to pay people to tell us what they really think. Mm -hmm. And so if you ask them, you know, who do you, where do you think Obama was born? You know, maybe half of them are going to say Kenya. Well, if you pay them, maybe not so many are going to mm -hmm. <laughs> tell you. If we tell you, you're going to pay him if you're right or wrong. Right. And so if they actually have something on the line, maybe they are much more willing to interrogate the, uh, the information. I mean, it's, all, it's kind of scary what they're saying. Is anybody just, I mean, it, um, it, because I thought it was going to be an issue of storytelling or how do we get people, you know, how do I get my students to want to read the news and credible fact-based news and how do I take that to the broader population? What you seem to be saying, both of you, is that the population in the United States of America right now prides itself on, on, on not caring whether something's a lie. I, I don't think that's I don't think that's what we're saying. I, I do think that in some domains of life, 
people that are highly partisan, which is a chunk, not all Americans are highly partisan, are prepared to, to believe what their leaders in their tribe are saying. I do think that's true. But I don't think that that means that it's the end. I don't think that's a, um, a permanent state of being. I, I think that young people are completely fed up with the way that politics uh, work right now and aren't, aren't uh, fitting in these uh, partisan lines. But no, I, I, think, I think political life is one sphere of life. It's a really important one. It's one that we think about a lot, but it's not, it's not, it's not everything. And I, I do think there are a lot of parts of life that people want the truth. But I, again, I'm going to get the downer here and mm. say that <laughs> politics is not everything, but it's a lot. Yeah. And so the sort of traditional view in political science is that, that once you have a stable democracy, relatively wealthy country, you're just there. That's it. You just stay there forever. And the early 21st century has shown us that that's not the case. If you look at countries like Hungary, Poland, yep. Turkey, you know, Brazil, uh, there is this, this phenomenon of democratic backsliding. That when you lose trust in, in the judiciary, the rule of law, when you lose trust in the media, when you lose trust in electoral integrity, all of which we're seeing right now, there's this very real possibility that we will uh, migrate to these authoritarian regimes. So I think this isn't just uh, you know politics is one form of life. I think you're right that when something's on the line, people actually will you know seek out the truth. The problem is all these small changes uh, to the way that our, yeah. our institutions operate can actually have dramatic effects. Maybe they take 20, 30 years, and it's not tanks on the street. That's not how it ends. It ends through the gradual erosion of these democratic institutions. Yeah, and that reminds me of some work. I, I got really interested in income inequality for a while. I was, I was interested in the psychological aspects and, and started looking at the history of it. And uh, to Sherrod's point, we find that uh, when you look through history, when income inequality in whatever society you want to look at uh, reaches some point, and it varies for each society, but there's some sort of breaking point where it's like the social contract has been, uh, has been broken. Uh, you see trust in institutions decline very quickly. So Florence, for example, was this amazing society, and at some point the rich people were like, you know what, we're not letting other people in on this, and they, they sort of like... Um, prevented other people from uh, becoming, uh, joining the market. And, and that's the beginning of the decline of Florence. And it, it, so I think there's, it's a really complex problem. It's not anything to do with necessarily technology. It's not just polarization. I think this sort of income inequality uh, part of it is really important too because it's like, why am I, why am I, I, I'm giving my life in part to this social contract, but I'm not getting anything back, but a few people are getting everything. So I think, I, you know, I don't disagree with you there, um, but I don't think that it's like, Technology is causing it, or uh, necessarily polarization is everything. I think it is a it's a really complex thing, but the, yeah. it's not that it's without danger. It's yeah. not without, without danger. Sure. Just shifting gears a bit, going back to the algorithm discussion. How much of um, is it really untrustable algorithm? Untrustable algorithms, quote unquote, is due to coders not understanding the, the physics of the problem. How much mistrust is just due to? I can't. It's a, it's a curse word. Bad programming. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, these are related issues. And so, you know, what is bad programming? I, I think a lot of it isn't malicious programming. I think a lot of it is, is uneducated programming or inexperienced programming. And that's exactly what we're trying to do on this campus is, is every, basically every student codes now, but we haven't actually given them the thorough curriculum that's necessary to make these ethical decisions that are, that are necessary for them to understand the implications of the systems that they design, in part because we, as a community, as a computer science community, we haven't actually thought of this ourselves as deeply as we need to until relatively recently. And so I do think that these are unforced errors in some cases. Um, I suspect, at least anecdotally, that that's a lot of it, that there is probably some element of malicious intent, but my guess is most of it is just inexperience. And there I am optimistic that with, uh, with more education that we actually can get these algorithms to perform better uh, than they currently are. And we actually, as an aside, have interesting classes uh, partnering between computer science and the journalism, cl you know, journalism classes where the, the coders are working together with the journalists mm -hmm. on solving some of the, the solutions around making sure people get the news they need to be uh, 
smart citizens. Back to trust online and social media. This is a, a smart question about Facebook began with a robust web of trust among users authenticated by virtue of .edu email addresses. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't longer have to have this authentication necessarily. I mean, I think they're trying to go back to it. Would that work, digital ID on a larger mm -hmm. scale, like I identification to restore trust? Yeah, I, th I certainly think that's a major trend that a lot of the platforms are moving towards. They want to be able to authenticate people more. Uh, I think there's almost um, like a banking model we'll start to see where you have to authenticate who your uh, customer is. Um, because, I th you know, one of the major problems right now is uh, I could go right now and for $179 buy about 1,000 followers for my whatever page I want. And I just checked that yesterday. And so, because I buy fake followers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very popular online. Um, but no, so there's this huge market. And so how do they do mm -hmm. that? It's bots, it's faked accounts. Um, and so, you know, Twitter, recently Twitter estimated that about 15% of, um, of its accounts are bots. It's probably a little bit higher. So no, I, I, I think this idea of who are we, that warranted notion that I mentioned before is important. And, and you know, it, we're going to see probably a, a splintering. So there'll be platforms where you have authenticated type IDs and accounts, and then there'll be more wild, wild west, like um, this platform, Gab, that's getting a lot of attention where it's like you can be anonymous on it and say whatever you want and, and things like that. So I do see there'll be some bifurcation in that. Char, do you have a thought on the authenticity question? I know when you talk to the human rights people internationally, they'll say, this is terrible because that it undermines all the things that social media is actually used for good for rallying people in, 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 in places where, where social media is used as a tool to crack down on dissidents. But I guess that's a cost-benefit analysis there, right? In terms of... Yeah, I mean, I, thought, I think a lot of social media use is, is trade-offs. You know, and it, I mean, in the, people always ask me, is it, good, is it good for me or bad for me? And if I never hear that question again, I think it will be good because it's, every, it's everything. It's in here. I'll skip yeah, it. our colleague in the department, Byron Reeves, often talks about media and technology is like fire. You know, it'll warm your house and it'll burn it down. But, you know, what are you going to do? Not use heat anymore? You know, you're not, not going to cook? And so in the big giant meta-analysis I mentioned, um, we, we see overall there's no effect on psychological well-being overall. Okay? When you look across all 256 studies. But when you look inside the well-being, kinds of well-being, we see yeah, if you, you use it a lot, you get a little bit of a bump up in anxiety and depression. It's significant, but it's really small. You also get a bump up, it's a little bit bigger, but still pretty small, in relational well-being. So how well connected I feel with my friends and family. So there's the trade-off. You use social media a lot, you're going to be a little, bit, a little bit more anxious, a little more depressed, and you're going to feel more connected with your social network, your, your, your people. So. I think trade-offs are, are, are just like a part of life. And if we focus on one or the other, uh, we make mistakes. Um, this is a getting back to the question of where I said, we can't do it. Can we please speak to the correlation of trust and distraction. It seems there's uh, no time or energy to decide on trust when there's so much distracting. Can our brains even process all of this at once? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, now well, so I know I feel, next year, yeah, I I feel like that all the time, but, <laughs> uh, but again, we're not the first humans to feel that. So there's, I, I have this really great slide from the 16th century. So this is after the printing press comes uh, along and um, it's a big giant wheel, almost like a water wheel. And uh, monks would put books into it so it could hold like eight books at a time and they could move it around and look at like different pages in different books. And what was it for? It was to deal with the information overload, overload because there was like 10 or 11 books being published a year. It was insane. They couldn't take it. So they were developing technology to deal with that. And now we, we look at it. Now, of course, uh, I mean, uh, there's magnitudes of different, uh, of scale different here. But I, I, again, I just think like we're not the first generation to feel like we're overloaded with information at all. But is it possible that's just getting worse? Over time, that ever, that is actually true. <laughs> right, right. Now, now it's is, true. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> but it we, actually is we were worried true. before, but, but now, now we're really worried. <laughs> now I mean, really I feel bad. the urge to check my email if I were to use email. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, right no, now. I mean that that mm -hmm. is uh, you know you. It, how many of you have been looking at your um, your screen reports that Apple sends out once a week now? Has anybody yeah. seen that? And it is shocking how often yeah. we check our phones. Uh, again, Byron, who I just mentioned, it, it, you know, we're checking our phones well over hundred, sometimes two, three hundred times a day. Day, and usually it's for seconds and and so you know that might be really problematic uh, for sure but we don't know we don't know if that's just like a new norm 
and our brains are like really happy. Finally, you know, <laughs> finally I'm getting enough information and stimulation. So, but we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we might have a guess. <laughs> I want to apologize to the audience because there's so many. There's like a hundred amazing questions here. So I'm trying to get through as many as I can. Um, so I apologize if I don't get to yours. So one person says, do you think the internet's always going to be like this? Filter bubbles, confirmation bias accelerator, fake news, or is this just the current set of business models, technology slash cultural patterns? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's easy to blame the internet. Um, we've had filter bubbles forever, or at least echo chambers forever, offline echo chambers. And you just think about neighborhood segregation and even like workplace segregation, who you're interacting with. And so again, I think it's somewhat misplaced to say that it's the internet that's a problem and so all we have to do is fix the internet. It's not either the problem or the solution to any of these uh, issues that we've been talking about. And so I think the internet is going to evolve and in some ways it's going to get better, in some ways it's going to get worse. But I think fundamentally we're not going to, again maybe this would be me, me being pessimistic, is that we're, we're not going to have this like fluid transformation of ideas where everyone is perfectly informed mm -hmm. and living and just like you know, with these you know, perfectly rational thought processes. I don't think that's going to happen. We've never had that mm. before. We're not going to have it in the future. The internet is going to play some role in this, but again, I don't think it's actually the proximate cause for the situation that we're in right now. Yeah. Mm. And, I, and I like the questioner's mention of the business model. So Sharad and I, neither of us do a lot of economics or business thinking, but I, I do feel like the business model is, is a big problem in a lot of this. The advertising is the core thing and, and when you think about fake news or you think about um, computational propaganda, all these things that we're worried about influencing us, it's usually because of you know, advertising is at the core of it. So when Sheryl Sandberg went to Capitol Hill a while back and what's his name? Trey Gowdy, the congressman. From Where is he from? To South, Carolina. South Carolina. He was trying to understand some of this in terms of the incentives of some of, one portion of the internet, okay, Facebook, big portion of it. And he said, so if I write it's Tuesday, I'm paraphrasing obviously, if I write it's Tuesday, but it's really Wednesday, so that's okay? And she said something like, yes, that's not a violation of our terms of service, Congressman. And he was kind of hung up on this idea of, so basically anybody, to make the point that anybody can write just about anything and it can go viral and then we've got these problems. So is there a way to, um, and whenever I talk to people at the companies about this, they say, oh, you are for censorship. Mm. But is there a way to change the incentives, apropos of the question, to prioritize information that's actually true? Like, for example, Apple News, there was a big story in, in the business section of the Times this weekend. They're curating. They're, they're saying, we're picking. We're not leaving it to the, no offense to the algorithms, Shard. But, like, we're <laughs> going to pick it. We're going to have a human doing it. So are there ways to, without censoring, mm -hmm. uh, uplift credible information on the Internet? Mm -hmm and push down well, less reliable. That's what Facebook's doing is not lifting mm -hmm. up, but it's pushing down. So mm -hmm. when things get flagged as, uh, as fake or hate speech, what they're trying to do now, one of their main tactics is called demotion. So if you're, um, if you're, trying, if you're using something like fake news as a method of, um, uh, as a method, usually you have two motivations. One is persuasion. So I'm going to convince you that about something to be true or profit. And for both of those to work, I need my uh, post, whatever it is, to spread widely. Right? Um, that's what you're always looking for. And so uh, Facebook's primary tool right now, and there's some evidence that it's working, um, is you can say it, but they're just not going to share it with anybody or share it with as few people as possible. And so that's currently uh, one of their main, their main techniques. It's not, it's not going to solve everything, but that is one of the, the main ideas. So it allows people to say something, just trying to limit how far it can spread. I think one of the problems here is there's not this dichotomy between real news and yeah. fake news. Yeah. That there's this whole gray area in between. I actually almost never see fake news, like truly fake news. But what I do see a lot of is things that it's like, oh, is that headline really accurate? Well, it's like clearly designed to get that click. Yeah. And you see this even in these well-regarded mainstream media outlets. You see this in the New York Times and the Washington Post. All of these things, it's like, yeah, that's kind of true. You know, certainly not fake. But it's, it's really designed to get me to click on that link. And this is what really bothers me, that I think that in getting away from that incentive is very hard to do. I and mean, people want their stories read. And if it's in that gray area, what are you going to do? Because I think then you do worry about censorship. You can say, OK, that's slightly misleading. But it's like, now how can we really decide? If it's fake, I think there is a class of views where we really say that shouldn't be spread. Mm -hmm. 
But what about all that gray area, which I think actually occupies the vast majority of, of what we see online? Sure, they're not putting clickbait only because they want their stories to be read. They've got to drive traffic to the site so the advertisers will have enough money because people aren't buying subs subscriptions. So if people bought more subscriptions, then we wouldn't need as much clickbait, theoretically, right? So, but I, just to weigh in quickly on this, because if you come back to the media question, I think you know, people are asking, what's a trustworthy media? Uh, you know, I'll tell you what's not a good idea. Making Facebook your main domain for getting your news. It's not built for it. It's just mm. not built for it, right? Completely So agree. go old school, all of us who email, go to a, a site and, and read it there perhaps. So people coming back to this bias algorithms question, I love, in the, in the 1970s, major symphony orchestras began holding auditions behind mm -hmm. a curtain so as not to see the performer. This resulted in considerably more women being selected. Could algorithms be today's equivalent of the orchestra? audition curtain by eliminating the unconscious bias many people might have when seeing the job applicant or the resume. Might interviews be de-emphasized in the hiring process? What do you think, Dean Whittem? Is that a good one? <laughs> I know, I mean, this is, I mean, it's interesting, no? Yeah, so I think it's, yeah. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's interesting. One thing that's um, nice to note is that there's this idea that you want algorithms not to consider things like gender and race. And that feels super intuitive. But what we found in our research is that that's not always bad to consider these protected characteristics. So let me give you one example. If you look at um, uh, these risk determinations that, that judges use when deciding whether or not to detain or release somebody, uh, if you look at just the basic features like um, someone's age or their criminal history, well, women tend to recidivate, tend to reoffend much less like much less often than men with exactly the same characteristics. And so if you are gender neutral, and again, some jurisdictions do this, then what are you going to end up doing? You're going to end up overestimating the risk of women, underestimating the risk of men. And if you make your decision based on that alone, you're going to end up incarcerating relatively low risk women. And so that's one reason that some jurisdictions have actually decided to use something like gender uh, in their risk determinations to make it more fair. And so again, this pushes against our intuition of what does it mean to be fair. In some cases, we actually want to look behind the curtain mm -hmm. to make sure that we're making the most equitable decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for sure, just following up on the AI, on the, a little related in terms of how is trust represented in AI today in mm -hmm. software? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's a hard, it's a complicated question. So one way that, that we use trust again in, in, in these types of high stakes decisions is making the algorithm interpretable. So you can look at it, you can inspect it, it's not a black box. So traditional machine learning, how did it work? We're just looking at that epsilon improvement and we didn't care how it got there. We just like stuck lots and lots of information in and we have some binary decisions, show this ad, not show this ad, and that was machine learning. And it really didn't matter what that mechanism was and no one was interrogating how that algorithm actually worked. So we discovered that in a lot of these high stakes decisions, that's not good enough. I can't just walk into a courthouse and say, and have this algorithm say, okay, you just detain this person, release that person, People don't trust that system. And so now what we're moving to is a, is, a, is a white box, a clear box that we can look into and say, this is how exactly how the algorithm is working. It's looking at this factor, this factor, and this factor. It's giving you this weight, and you can interrogate it. So that's just one solution that I think for, for trying to build up trust in these types of high stakes algorithms. There's a lot of people who want to know some solutions here, and we've touched on some of them, but how we can use, for example, information technology to, I like this phrase, whoever wrote it, to, to reorient people to, back towards the truth. Mm -hmm. Is there mm -hmm. some, you yep. know, and it sort of relates to some of these questions of how we can use AI and all these other things to do that. Are there things that come to mind that aren't being tried yet, that are coming down the pike? Yeah, I mean, I think... In the long run, I am an optimist. I mean, I feel like you know, with enough time, with enough data, with enough analysis, we will find out what's going on, and this will replace our anecdotal evidence. Again, going back to police discrimination, for a long time, we had to rely on anecdotal evidence, and that, I think, serves us well in some circumstances, but there's also a place for data and rigorous statistical analysis. And so I do believe that you know, so, at least some decision makers, some subset of decision makers fundamentally care about the truth. And in some of these circumstances, we can use advances in, in AI, advances in, in data collection and data analysis to uncover those truths that we previously couldn't. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the people we need to, con to convince that to go back to data and real information are the decision makers, you said. Yeah. Maybe we don't need to worry about everybody. I mean, I do think we need to, there is this PR issue yeah. here that we do need to get 
um, people who care about the facts to you know, you know, elect politicians who care about the facts. I think that's a very real constraint. Um, but again, when we work with people who are, who are actively making the decisions, I don't see this type of um, neglect of, of the facts that, that I encounter much more often when there's nothing in the line. Well, I guess we could argue about whether that's happening when they discuss climate change policy, though, for example. Mm -hmm. right? Are they actually considering the full range of facts when they're evaluating in the Trump administration environmental regulations? Are there, or are they cherry picking certain things or are they just getting rid of certain data from the websites you know what I mean like yeah. how do we know that they're actually so it's optimistic in the long run oh the long run <laughs> yeah long run. <laughs> yeah I, I think it's pretty clear that the, that people are in you know cherry picking and they're trying to uh, you know here's what my goal is deregulation and I'm gonna you know do whatever it takes to get there mm -hmm. so yeah I know I think that's one of those examples of it's a political space where they're just trying to get to some ends and they've decided in their value system that you know perhaps not finding the truth is, is fine. Um, but to your question, you know, every other week I have somebody that, that wants to meet with me because they're in the valley and they're starting a new company and they want to improve news. You know, uh, we're going to do crowdsourcing. We're going to, you know, and it's, it's, uh, something will happen, right? There's innovation taking place on this. There's a solution here somewhere. I don't know what it is. But also I think there's, there's current um, systems that are very powerful. So we've been looking at uh, Google, new, uh, Google Search in particular. And, and uh, you re may remember that Trump said, okay, it's biased, it's against me, it's, it's, it's all this. And we had been doing a project for the last two years looking at how Google's search results, whether they were like biasing people out towards the fringes, left versus right, or emphasizing uh, websites that were more central. And really cool results. Uh, one of my uh, students here in computer science uh, Google's very much uh, results are based on authority. So does the site that, that this is linking to have authority? And it, it was really uh, eye-opening to see that Google search is a very, is much less biased than if you just went on Twitter or Facebook or something like that. It, it gets good information uh, through Google. So there's an existing established system. So we only have about seven minutes left, so we don't have enough time to get through all these Trump, there's a lot of Trump questions. Um, uh, and I want you to have time for some final thoughts, and I want to be respectful of people's time. It seems that Trump wants to use all the oxygen in the room by making outrageous lies. The media is playing into his game by giving him airtime. Should the press just say, Trump lied in this case, and move on to another topic, or Trump like a kid that makes more outrageous actions to get attention if ignored? Any thoughts? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, well, so uh, if anybody is interested in, in more, uh, there, there's a, a, a group called Data and Society. Uh, they're out of uh, New York, and they just released a really great uh, report uh, last month on media manipulation. Uh, so it's not specifically about Trump, but uh, one of their case studies is the alt right. So this is uh, far right, uh, white nationalist, white supremacist. And um, they sort of outline how they have developed techniques based on some of the counterculture that came out of Silicon Valley in the 60s even, on how to manipulate uh, journalists, how to get more airtime, how to get people talking about it, how to mainstream your crazy idea. And um, it's, it's really worrisome. But the cool thing is it's starting to be documented now. And I know in uh, communication we have a really great journalism program that Janine's part of. And um, that's now starting to be taught. Journalists are now starting to be made aware of the fact that they're being manipulated um, uh, with, with these sort of media techniques. So again, not to sound too repetitive, but I, I feel like with education like this, they'll, we'll start to understand how to deal with that. Now, Trump, I don't think it's, I, I don't know if you can ignore him. He's the president of the United States. Can we treat it differently? Yes, I think so. But, but I think journalists are sort of bound by the fact that there's a normative relationship here where he's the president, you have to take what he says seriously and react to that. And, and I think they're just now adjusting to the fact that he's not following presidential norms. Let me just say a quick word on this, if it's okay. That um, I think that's right, Jeff, that, that the, the, the White House media and the media in Washington in general are trying to cover him like they've covered every president. The right. president said something, you gotta cover it. That right. was sort of the, the impulse reaction. Um, and I know there's a lot of debates going on, say within editorial boards at the top newspapers about do we cover what he says or do we cover what he does? What do we focus on? Big debates, people are fighting about it every day. And, and, and I think you wanna try and draw a distinction between uh, the print, newspapers and the, the cable news outlets, right? Because the cable news outlets are strictly profit ratings driven, 
right? So they're going to carry his, they're just going to carry it. They're going to bring on panels to talk about the 14th Amendment all day today. Can he, re what is it today? I mean, every day it's something else. Today was, he's going to take away the right to citizenship. I mean, they do a whole day on that. Is that the most newsworthy story of the day? Is that the, does it merit that much coverage? I agree with the person who wrote the question that we need to be able to say, he said this and then move on, right? Do both, but not at such length. So we're just about almost out of time. So I just want to end with a really easy question of, what if we fail? <laughs> what, if we, what if all this stuff we've been talking about, technology, and we're going to find the solutions? I know you're an optimist. I can never persuade you not to be. Char, you're pretty optimistic, i got to say. The Me? Whole night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But what if we fail? I mean, what happens if we can't restore trust in this nation, in all these institutions? What are the consequences? I mean, I think democratic backsliding is a very real possibility. Uh, we see this in other countries around the world, and we see it happen from the uh, uh, sort of decline of all these institutions, the judiciary, the media, the electoral system. And so I think the stakes are enormous, and I think there is actually a pretty good chance we are going to fail. So this, we can't have this sort of American exceptionalism of saying, oh, yeah, no, we, we've had this stable democracy, and we don't have to worry about these things that are happening around us. This is very real, uh, and I think there is a lot on the line. Jeff, final word? Yeah, I, I actually don't disagree with Sherrod on this one. Um, and, and I'm we all seem so surprised. I know, right? Again, I'm always so surprised. I'm an optimist because I believe in, in, in people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, we're in a, it, it, it's certainly true that there's people that are willing to uh, believe um, things that may seem false to them, but they're going to believe it anyways because it's this tribal, this polarizing thing. And, and so, the risk of failure is real. Uh, I'm not saying that like no matter what we're going to be fine, but I, I just believe in people's um, desire to, to really uh, understand what is going on in their world and ultimately to make, the, make a choice that's based on, on evidence. And so I guess my optimism is based in, in my belief in people, not in technology uh, and all those things. But, but you know, it, I want to meet some of these people that <laughs> yeah, yeah. hanging out with these <laughs> right, Canadians. Right. All these go to Canada, <laughs> say hello to everybody. Um, you know, they're, they're, but mm. you know, there's worrisome things like you know the, the election in Brazil, uh, it, the Italian election. So when you look at the political space, there's definitely alarm bells going off. Absolutely, um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Optimist in the long term. We have a lot of work to do here in social sciences and H&S and in engineering. And I want you to please join me in thanking our panelists. For this